So we're very happy to have Ali Inayat here at our MOPA seminar um, to give a two-week uh, uh, special with uh, on tightness, solidity, and internal categoricity. So go ahead, Ali. Um, thank you very much for uh, giving me the chance to talk about this material. Um, let me start with uh, an apology to those of you who uh, um, saw a condensed version of this talk uh, in uh, April back in Cornell. Uh, we had a meeting uh, for seeing the material again. Uh, this is an expanded version um, of, of that material that was presented in 40 minutes. Um, also, uh, Leshek is... Uh, who's also in the audience that uh, needs a double apology because he was subjected to a version of this talk also in Warsaw sometime about a year ago. Um, okay, with, after that apology, let's start. Um, so um, I'm going to tell the story which begins with a paper of Albert, um, who's in the audience, uh, Albert Visser. Um, 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 this paper, uh, Categories of Theories and Interpretations, is, is a quite rich paper, uh, has a lot of very interesting results and uh, not a very beautiful framework. Um, and uh, somewhere tucked in there is a result that uh, basically I'm going to focus in and then try to uh, see the kind of uh, uh, road that it leads to. Uh, um, it was based on a conference in Tehran. That's why the name of the, uh, uh, of the volume is called Logic in Tehran. Um, now, um, a few years later, I, I wrote a paper uh, uh, which was published uh, in the uh, uh, Visserfest, basically, volume uh, um, in 2016, um, where I extended um, uh, Albert's result to theories other than PA. Uh, Albert's result that I'm focusing was by PA. Um, and um, then um, a few years uh, after that, uh, Joe, um, Joe Hankins and um, Alfredo Freire, I'm skipping the middle names here, uh, although I think for Alfredo, the mi middle name is part of his last name. Um, anyway, um, so they, they uh, wrote a paper focusing on the set theoretic part of the story. And I'm gonna say a few words about uh, the very nice results they obtained. Um, and um, uh, on a parallel path, uh, there's been work uh, that Yoko Bonanen has, has done. Uh, so basically, I'm just putting here three papers, uh, the most recent of which kind of summarizes uh, uh, the results of the previous two on the, on the page, uh, um, that I will say something about the relationship between this notion of internal categoricity explored in Yoko's papers um, and, uh, and what I'll be talking about today. Uh, also, Yoko and... Uh, Maddie have, have a, a long paper uh, on this topic in the archive and um, on the topic of internal categoricity, uh, uh, looking at the philosophical uh, aspect of the whole story. Um, and um, those of you who were with us last week, um, 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 Cameron Williams and, uh, and uh, Alfredo uh, Freire have uh, gotten some very nice results also about um, the uh, part of the discussion here, which relates to second order arithmetic. Um, okay. Um, the results I'll be talking about here are gonna be mostly written up. So I'll be um, in the second part of the talk, I'll be talking about new material. That what I'll be talking about today is gonna be basically uh, all published work as far as I remember. Okay. Um, so this is, uh, let me go back up. Um, this is um, Visser's theorem. Um, in blue, you see the word retract uh, that I will define, uh, but let's um, read it uh, together. If U and V are deductively closed extensions of PA and U and V are in the same language as PA, um, if U is a retract of V, then V is a subset of U. Um, and then um, in particular, uh, PA is tight, uh, i.e. if U and V are bi-interpretable, uh, then U is equal to V because then both U is going to be a subset of V and V is going to be a subset of U. So by interpretability is also, so the terms in blue is what I'm going to be defining. Um, but um, just knowing the definition of by interpretability as basically being a, a stronger version of retract, um, the second bullet point immediately follows from, um, from, from the theorem, the, the retract theorem. Um, okay, so uh, I will begin basically uh, this theorem 
as uh, a motivation of, of the definitions to come here. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna begin really slow. Uh, so apologies for those of you who are, are experts at interpretations, but I found interpretations to be, uh, it's a subject that uh, usually uh, people who are experts in it go very fast over giving talks to fellow experts, but because I think there are probably people in the audience who uh, haven't seen uh, interpretations that much, I'd like to uh, kind of slow down things a bit. Um, so this relationship that um, is Alpert's notation, this triangle, uh, is, is used to, to talk about interpretability uh, where A and B are either both structures uh, or they're both theories. So basically interchangeably, depending on the context, sometimes A and B are structures and sometimes in a more general case, they are or theories. The theory version is the stronger version or a more general version than the structural version. Uh, and there are different ways of reading it. A is interpretable in B, uh, B interprets A, or there is an interpretation of A and B. Uh, mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to begin with some um, this basic... Is, there is a sort of subset. Pardon? Did I hear something about subset? No, I'm 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 sorry. I did, didn't realize I did not mute myself. <laughs> okay, okay, no problem. Uh, okay, so uh, the the point of the examples I'm going to give is basically to just give you different flavors of interpretations instead of just technically defining them. I'll just verbally mention them. So this this first interpretation of uh, looking at the uh, interpretability of uh, the natural numbers with less than uh, in natural numbers uh, in, in greater than or equal to. Uh, actually, uh, I'm, what, what you're about to see, uh, let's see, uh, what did I write down? Because for a moment, I thought I might have to have it backwards. Uh, yeah, I have it backwards here, which is, uh, which, is, which is also a good example. So imagine this structure uh, in, uh, interpreting, being interpreted in, 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 in this structure. So, uh, so just switch these two. So the point is that you could define more than or equal to as, as just less than or and, and using less than and equal to. So, so the structure of n with less than interprets, so, so switch the direction of this inequality, basically, this, this triangle. Um, so does it. Um, of course, it works the other way around too, but then this translation is not going to work. Uh, so here, uh, of course, the point is that I'm, I'm assuming we have equality in the language. Sometimes you know, people assume not having equality in the language. And, uh, it, and even not having equality uh, is going to be no problem in this case. You can still uh, you can still interpret. Okay, this this other example um, is a little fancier. Um, the um, uh, yeah, it looks like in all these cases I've done my 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 triangles backwards. So so uh, I'm only noticing it right now. So the idea is that um, I'm, if you do this backwards, the idea is that this is the interpreting structure. Just imagine this wants to interpret uh, omega plus omega with epsilon. This, so the point is you want to define um, the, a, a new relationship on, on natural numbers. Um, and uh, that's pretty easy to do. You could just say that uh, um, basically all even numbers come before all the odd numbers and otherwise the ordering is the same. So if you look at the blue, um, the blue line, uh, either X and Y are both even and X is less than Y, or X is even and Y is odd, or X and Y are both odd and X is less than Y. So by, by looking at this relationship, which is in the language of less than, um, and less than of course is definable in, um, in natural numbers, uh, you, could, you could define a copy of omega plus omega comma epsilon. So the point here is that Interpretability between structures, the structure which is being interpreted, we, we care about its isomorphism type, not literally what are the elements of it, but by the isomorphism type of it. Um, so, um, in this, uh, of course, in this, uh, this example can be generalized by replacing omega plus omega to any, any ordinal less than omega one CK, any recursive ordinal, which is the same thing as any arithmetical ordinal. Um, Okay, um, so, so again, let's bear in mind these triangles should always be flipped. So the idea is that this structure is going to be interpreted in, um, in um, oh, maybe, actually, no, I think that the one I'm about to write down is probably correct. Let's, let's, let's watch together now whether Ali is learning things backwards or not. Um, so by just removing um, 
the elements zero and one from the closed interval zero one, you get a structure which is uh, isomorphic to the real line. So by restricting the universe of discourse of this structure by just elim eliminating zero and one and keeping the same ordering, you do get a structure which is uh, isomorphic to the real line with less than. So yeah, again, this, this, this triangle should be flipped. So basically um, we're, um, we're interpreting the real line with less than in the closed interval zero one with less than, okay? Um, same idea here. Uh, I want to, again, because this is supposed to be backwards, I want to interpret um, the complex plane in the, um, in the real line. Um, so before I maybe look at this example, let's go back to the previous example. This previous example is an example of an interpretation that is uh, restricted because we're limiting the items in the universe on which we're defining a relationship. The examples before that, we didn't limit the universe. We just looked at the same universe as we had. We just defined a, a new ordering on it or whatnot. Um, in this example that we're looking at is a two-dimensional interpretation. We want to interpret the complex numbers in the um, in the um, field of real numbers. And this is, of course, the famous interpretation we learn um, in early on in our college days when we learn a little bit about complex numbers that the operations plus and times and complex numbers can be thought about as operations on just on the Euclidean plane. Um, and they're all definable in terms of the ordinary plus and ordinary times. And same idea with uh, interpreting- uh, Ali, excuse yes, me, I've got a question here. How yes, is that, inter you, you interpreted the complex numbers in pairs of reals. How is that an interpretation into the reals? Thank you. Uh, so this is an example of a two-dimensional interpretation. So, so the, in this particular case, uh, the items are pairs of real numbers as opposed to just real numbers. So there's, the, the claim is that, uh, meaning this, this, uh, this interpretability um, symbolism allows multidimensional interpretability in general. In the examples we will, we'll be looking at in, in these lectures, because we have coding, it's not gonna make a difference. But when you have um, structures or theories which don't have a pairing function or a coding function, then you do care about what's the dimension of your interpretation. So in this case, you would say the complex numbers are two-dimensionally interpretable in the real line. Are these multi-dimensional interpretations, do they have the same status as one-dimensional interpretations? Well, uh, I, would say, I would say many of the good benefits go through. So for example, um, if you, since we know, if you have a proof that um, the, uh, that, that RCF, real closed fields um, are complete, and you have a two-dimensional interpretation of the complex numbers in them, then it shows that ACF, algebraic closed fields are, are complete. So yeah, many of the results go through. Decidability results and completeness results, undecidability results go through. Uh, so they're, they're intellectually quite, quite robust. They're, they're not limiting. No. Um, and um, yeah, and this, this last example is basically, uh, um, interpreting modular arithmetic in the, in the ring of, um, of um, um, integers. And the point of this particular example is that I'm redefining equality. The point is that in some inter interpretations, um, you're allowed to redefine equality. You don't have to interpret equality as, uh, as equality. So those that um, do interpret equality as equality, those interpretations that don't tamper with equality, are called identity preserving. So the catchphrases are identity preserving or restricted or unrestricted where you uh, limit the, uh, the domain of the objects in the domain of discourse. Okay. Um, now for theory interpretability, uh, we basically look at the same idea and, uh, and try to make it uniform. So if we have two theories um, that are first order, um, U and V, um, and their languages are LU and uh, L sub U and L sub V. Um, um, I'm gonna define a one dimensional interpretation only because I want to have um, uh, an ease in, in my notation. And also because in this talk and the next talk, basically because we're talking about theories with coding, one dimensional interpretations are as good as uh, multi-dimensional ones. So I'm not gonna be worrying about tuples uh, in, in this definition. Um, so um, in this case, we want to write down what does it mean for you to be 
uh, interpretable by an interpretation I in a theory V. Uh, this means we have a translation of each uh, L of U formula into an L of V formula with the requirement that, um, that the interpreting theory V proves uh, each of these translations of the sentences in U. Of course, this translation has to um, be subject to certain uh, requirements. Um, so uh, first of all, you're allowed to, you're allowed to, do, to, um, to specify a domain formula for uh, what are the objects that are going to uh, count as the objects in your domain of discourse of what you're interpreting. Um, and, and also each of the predicate uh, symbols of the theory that is being interpreted are supposed to um, have a translation into a formula of the interpreting theory. So each, uh, each P basically should be assigned a, uh, how, how its translation is gonna be, which is a, a sub P. I'm assuming that um, our theories are just uh, in, in a relational language for the ease of just writing this definition down. Um, and then you lift the translation to the full first order language, having seen how to, how to start the atomic case um, by just having a commute with, with Boolean connectives, uh, propositional connectives, and also with uh, when it comes to uh, quantifiers, you do the obvious thing. Basically, the translation of for all x phi is that for all x, if x is in the domain, then its translation holds. And the same thing for the existential. Um, okay, then, then we, we just simply say U is interpretable in V if, um, if uh, there is such a translation that does the job. So, th so these triangles are now all correct. And my examples are all backwards now. They're all correct. Uh, Ali, can you go back a slide? Uh, of course, yeah. Uh, with that, oh, the, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, do you, do you, uh, maybe, yeah, this might come up later, but, um, just curious, do you put any restrictions on the complexity of these uh, delta or, or, or these translations? In general, no. Although, uh, you know, here and there, there are some studies on basically uh, what happens to this, to this definition if you uh, put some, if you allow delta or the translations to be in a particular Mm -hmm. class of formulas, but the arbitrary definition is very generous. It mm -hmm. allows any first order. Okay. Uh, any other questions so far? Okay. Um, so the whole idea is that if you think of it model theoretically, if you have an interpretation of uh, U in V, um, you have a uniform way of building models of U from any model of, of V. Uh, and this model of U that you build, uh, I'll dec decorate it as M super I uh, when you give me a model of V. Um, so think of it as a uniform model construction. Um, and then uh, in the examples I wanna give now, uh, when it comes to examples about theory interpretation, um, I'm going to also use this notation of putting a slash over equality to indicate that U is interpretable in V, but not the other way around. Um, so, so, you, so basically, there are, U is interpretable in V, but they're not mutually interpretable. So this is the canonical pair of, or triple, no, quadruple <laughs> of theories that I like to uh, usually refer to as a, as a good way of starting here. Uh, <clears throat> Um, so this is the theory of algebraic closed fields of characteristic zero, and this is uh, the theory of real closed fields. So the, the, the two-dimensional interpretation I showed you, which is also sometimes known as the Hamilton interpretation, is uh, what allows one to be able to uniformly, in any real closed field, uh, construct the corresponding uh, version of uh, the, complex, uh, the complex field. And that's pretty much... Uh, why RCF interprets ACF zero. This zero is about characteristic again, zero. Uh, the fact that it doesn't go the other way around, um, this was observed a long time ago. There's an old paper of uh, Shicherba, a, a Polish logician who studied foundations of geometry, where he has a paper on interpretations and, it, and, and already back, I think it's a paper from the 70s, I think, uh, um, he observed that uh, uh, ACF zero is a stable theory, but RCF 
it's not a stable theory and, and, um, and the way interpretability works if, uh, um, if ACF zero being a stable theory interprets another theory, that other theory which is being interpreted also has to be stable and, and RCF is known not to be stable. So the, the failure here requires a little bit of uh, some footwork. Um, the, the, sorry. First of all, could you repeat the reference again or maybe email it to me? And secondly, I'm curious what the relation is, maybe it's the same or maybe it's different between this argument that Joel has uh, likes to talk about where, but he, he always mentioned it in terms of R and C, and I don't know if the cardinality is essential to that or not, because it is about the size of automorphism groups. Yeah, his argument works for R and C because R is rigid and uh, and C has lots of automorphisms. So uh, is that the general? Is that that's not how the general consideration works? No, the, no. In general, because uh, um, it is true because these observations are true, at least assuming choice that you have all these automorphisms, right? And yeah, stability is about. I mean, I mean, there are lots and lots of models of RCF of cardinality continuum and there's only the one for ACF zero and that's about stability too, right? Yeah, I guess that one is about, that's about, I guess, um, categoricity, right? Uh, right. So uh, that's a different consideration. Though. Yeah, yeah. So um, okay. so the categoricity of ACF, uh, if a theory is categorical, doesn't mean what it interprets must be categorical. Uh -huh. Oh, I see, but stability is preserved. Yeah, but stability, yeah, right. So it kind of, one has to kind of work with the definitions. You're right. I mean, I don't want to. Would I find an obvious citation for this in your paper or something for 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 uh, algebraic yeah, close fields? Seventies result, the general, the general result. That gives um, you the right. So I I have the reference um, somewhere, but not right in front of me. Uh, I just don't have a pen. I don't want it now. I don't want to interrupt your talk. Don't worry. Uh, just... still, no, no, no problem. I have your email, and I'll send it to you. But the paper okay. is by yeah, Shachirba. Very helpful email from last week. No problem, no problem. Uh, <clears throat> so, so real closed fields are interpretable in PA, um, uh, basically because in PA uh, you could, in, in PA you can talk about um, real algebraic numbers and, um, and, and, and uh, the fact that real algebraic numbers are form a real closed field is provable in PA. So that's, that's a uniform fact. It works in any, any model of PA and it's PA provable fact. Um, so that's uh, that's the interpretability of RCF in PA. Um, you have to know that you can Im implement a, a certain amount of algebra in piano arithmetic. And um, the other way around, uh, why RCF cannot interpret PA has to do with the completeness of RCF um, because um, of the fact that uh, RCF is, is, is complete, so then PA would have to be complete. Uh, and uh, of course, PA is not complete. Um, so. Um, um, for the last pair, uh, we, uh, in our elementary courses in set theory, we learn about phonomen ordinals, and, and in particular, the fact that finite phonomen ordinals form a model of PA. So that's the interpretability of PA in ZF. And the fact that PA does not interpret ZF, um, that's kind of an interesting fact. Uh, it has to do with the fact that um, ZF proves con of PA. Uh, and of course, PA doesn't prove con of PA. And the point is that if PA were to interpret ZF, then the model of PA that is doing the interpreting would be able to embed itself as an initial segment of the omega of the model of set theory that it interprets. That model of set theory says con PA, and because the model of PA is an initial segment of it, that model of PA would have to satisfy con PA. So basically the fact that PA does not interpret ZF has to do with, with Gödel's second incompleteness theory. Okay. And then we have um, some canonical examples of non-interpretability of, um, of what happens when you uh, extend a the theory conservatively in a predicative way. I mean, sometimes they're called predicative extensions, ACA zero uh, and PA and uh, Gödel-Bernays set theory and ZF. Um, the fact that ACA zero interprets PA is just uh, obvious. You simply just, just look at the numbers of the model of ACA zero, it has to be a model of PA. And the same thing with GB and ZF. The fact that it doesn't work the other way around has to do with a very key property of PA and ZF, namely that they're both um, 
um, able to prove the consistency of each of their finite fragments, their reflexive theories. And uh, ACA0 and GB are both finite theories. So if you put together Gödel's second incompleteness theorem that we used already a moment ago, finite actionmatizability of ACA0 and GB, and the fact that PA and ZF are reflexive, by a little bit playing around, you'll be able to quickly see that, uh, that P8 is not able to interpret ACA0 and the same thing with, uh, with ZF. Okay, uh, now we get to uh, finally the definition of a retract. What does it mean for you to be a retract of V? So to be a retract of V is a strengthening of mutual interpretability. Um, so first um, let's read what, what it says uh, in symbols and then I'm gonna also draw a picture. Um, so U is, is a retract of V if you have two interpretations, I and J, basically uh, going each way. Um, and also a binary formula in the language of U, such that starting with any model of M, um, that formula F, when interpreted in M, basically is an isomorphism between M and the result of of following uh, interpretations uh, I and J. So those of you who are lexically or uh, verbally oriented uh, would have no problem with this definition, but it's an extremely uh, hard definition to uh, swallow. So let's look at the picture. Okay, I'm gonna go through this picture kind of slowly. Uh, these boxes are uh, models of U and models of V. So items that go in the boxes are, are models. Um, the interpretations I, uh, I is, a, is basically a witness to V being interpretable in, in U. So the idea is that you start with any model in, in this box, M for example, and via I you'll be able to get a model um, of, uh, of the other theory, which is a model of V. Um, and the point of a retract is that um, not only should there be this I and J, this mutual interpretations, but also there should be a formula in the language of this theory, U, such that when you do this follow-up, uh, remember when you do this follow-up, um, you uh, composition of two interpretations is an interpretation. So you, um, you get a, the idea is that you get a, a model in U, but the point is that this model should be isomorphic in a strong way to M, not just isomorphic in the real world, but M, should have a formula in a definable way, M should recognize that the, this iterated dream, so to speak, is isomorphic to itself. I mean, if you think of interpretations as, as a dream, M in dreaming up a model N, and N, which is the dream of M, dreaming up another model, this M star becomes a dream in a dream. And the point is that um, this original object M should be able to see uh, why it's isomorphic to basically this, this iteration. Um, and if you have this picture also on this side, if the same situation happens here, you have bi interpretability. Uh, so this, so you can think of retract as being half of bi interpretability. And if you just think of uh, some maybe put a quick examples, uh, look at the bottom of this page here. Uh, um, oh, uh, I can see a little typo here, which, uh, so think of U as being ZF plus V equals to L and V to be just ZF. So please ignore this fin here. This fin here on the top is okay, but ignore this. I'm gonna put this over it so you don't even see it. Uh, so imagine uh, uh, the left-hand side box being models of ZF plus V equals to L. And um, um, let's see, uh, and, and, and the right-hand side to be just models of ZF. So the, to go from models, the interpretation I in this case would be just the identity interpretation. If I give you a model of ZF plus V equals to L, I says, I'll just give you, you know, yourself back. So I is very uninteresting. But coming back, if I give you a model of ZF, you could always define its constructible universe inside of that model. So J would be, uh, would be uh, basically the constructible universe construction of a given model of set theory. And uh, if you have a model that is already a model of, uh, of basically V equals to L, and you follow this interpretation, you get to itself back because the L of L is L. The constructible universe of the constructible universe is just the constructible universe. 
The same thing doesn't work for HOD for hereditarily ordinal definable sets. So the HOD operation doesn't, doesn't do the job here, but the L operation is absolute and it, 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 because of absoluteness considerations uh, works. So in this language, you can say ZF plus D equals to L uh, is a retract of, of ZF. Again, remember this fin on the second in this last line is extra, it should be just ZF. Similarly, uh, one can do the same kind of argument with, with PA for, for this example and, and, and ZF sub fin. Now ZF sub fin is the zermelo frankel set theory with the axiom of infinity re replaced by its negation with the axiom which says every set is finite. So, so it turns out if you begin with the model of PA uh, by just looking at um, the Ackerman coding basically, uh, you could interpret a model of ZF fin and uh, that's the interpretation from left to right. And from right to left, if I give you a model of ZF fin, you could look at the finite ordinals and you always will get a model of PA. But it is known that uh, in, this, in this line, PA and ZF fin are not biinterpretable, even though PA is a retract of ZF fin. And the same idea down here, ZF plus V equals to A is not biinterpretable with ZF, um, even though this guy is a retractor of that. Of that one. Um, Okay, so this is, this is um, remember, um, Albert's theory of has, has a term retract, so this is the definition of retract. Uh, and um, here is a definition of biinterpretable, uh, but because we saw the picture, just think, think about biinterpretable meaning that it's the same as the situation with retract, but the same nice situation which was happening on the left-hand side should also happen on the right-hand side. Uh, if you start with any model of of n and you go through j and then come back here, then the two models over on the right-hand side should be um, definably isomorphic. So that's the idea of uh, by, interpret by, interpret uh, by interpretation or by interpretability. Uh, these are mouthful. Uh, is this any different from u being a retractive v and v being a retractive u? Yes, because the witnessing um, when you say use a V-tract of V, uh, the I and J at work need not be the same I and J as uh, V is a retract of, of, of U. Oh. So the same I and J should work uh, when you do this diagram. You there know, must without... be a nicer way to say this than what, 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 what you wrote down. That, okay. Each is a retract of the other via the same interpretations. Yes, 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 yes. Um, and here I'm, I'm emphasizing the point that bi-interpretability is much stronger than mutual interpretability. Um, by uh, looking at the example of PA and PA plus the inconsistency of PA. Um, so by Visser's theorem, they have no chance of being um, bi-interpretable, but um, let's see, why are they mutually interpretable? Um, so one of them is obvious. So if I give you a model of PA plus incon PA, I've already given you a model of PA. So the identity interpretation interprets PA plus incon PA. Sorry, it, it interprets PA in PA plus incon PA. So one direction is absolutely uh, to make sure that the person you give this problem to uh, see, sees what the definition is. But the other direction is actually quite, quite interesting. Why does PA uh, interpret incon PA? Well, uh, this is based on the fact that, first of all, you can do the arithmetized completeness theorem in PA. That's part of the story. But the other part of the story is, is, is that um, PA can um, prove the consistency, as I mentioned earlier, of each of these finite sub theories. So just imagine I give you a model of PA and I wanna give you, and I'm asking you for, no, let me, let me backtrack. Suppose I want to, I'm asking you for a recipe such that when this recipe is applied in any model of PA, um, that model of PA is able to produce a model of PA plus incon PA. So the point is as follows. Your recipe would say, if con of PA holds, then just, uh, if con of PA holds, then by Gödel's incompleteness theorem, um, PA plus non-con PA is consistent. And therefore by the arithmetized completeness theorem, you could look at the first delta two definition of a completion of, of that theory. So there's basically a way of 
of getting the job done by, by just the arithmetized completeness theorem if, if, if Khan of PA holds. But if Khan of PA doesn't hold, then it seems like we're stuck. But the good news is that um, if you look at the least um, I sigma K such that I sigma K plus one is inconsistent, where I sigma K is the fragment of piano arithmetic for sigma K formulas. Since PA proves the con of I sigma one and also con of I sigma two and con of I sigma N for any concrete N, this K that you're describing as the least K such that, um, that uh, in con of uh, I sigma K plus one would have to be non-standard. And therefore, if you look at a mod of a look at, if you look at just I sigma K, it's gonna be a consistent theory. And therefore you could do your construction with that theory. You could, you could say by, by Gödel's in second incompleteness, this theory um, uh, doesn't prove its own consistency and I can use the arithmetic completeness theorem to, uh, to get the job done. So what I just quickly described, if I'm, if I'm um, correct historically was first observed by, uh, by Pfefferman uh, in, a, in a paper he wrote in the 60s um, on, on, on in interpretability, the fact, so to summarize, PA plus incon PA is interpretable in PA. But by the way, uh, PA plus con PA is not interpretable uh, because that would imply that PA is uh, able to prove its own consistency. So here, this not is really important. Okay, um, so um, ZF fin I already introduced as being the um, result of re replacing the action with infinity with this negation. Um, so uh, Ackerman in the 1940s um, introduced what we know as Ackerman coding uh, to interpret um, hereditarily finite sets uh, in the natural numbers with in piano arithmetic basically, but in the standard model of arithmetic. And then Michelsky was able to see that this interpretation can be reversed basically that uh, in a way that V omega as a structure and N uh, with plus and times are bi-interpretable. His paper was written in Russian. So very few people in the Western world um, uh, noticed it and it kind of went unnoticed uh, for some time. So, uh, but then by the time uh, Kay and Wong wrote, wrote their paper, um, uh, we got to see basically that it's not only two structures being bi-interpretable but two theories are bi-interpretable PA is bi-interpretable with ZF fin plus the statement TC, which says uh, every set has a transitive closure. So this is a, a very um, uh, important result about the relationship between PA and ZF fin. And, and somehow until this K1 paper was written, this, this result was often misquoted as by, by, by TC not being mentioned. Um, people would just say PA is bi-interpretable with ZF fin, but it turns out this TC is really important. Um, a few years after the K1 paper, uh, the paper that uh, Albert and Jim and I wrote, uh, we showed that ZF fin by itself is not, um, well, this isomorphism is bi-interpretable, right? It is not bi-interpretable with PA. Um, um, indeed, ZF fin is not even a retract of PA, even though PA is a retract of ZF fin. Okay, um, now uh, we're gonna talk about solidity and all these other stuff that uh, we're gonna focus on. So solidity um, is a property that I abstracted by looking at Albert's, uh, one of the Albert's results about um, piano arithmetic. And uh, let me first put the definition down here. It says, so a theory is solid if the following holds for any three models of it, M, M star and N. If M interprets N and N interprets M star, and also you have an isomorphism that is definable in M between the first structure and the last structure. Um, then there's an isomorphism definable in M between the first structure and the middle structure. You cannot squeeze anything in the middle of XCP, uh, which is not already isomorphic to the first thing. That's the definition of solid. Um, and Albert proved that, that PA is a solid theory and we'll see the proof in a moment. Um, now, TA's uh, a theory is neat if, uh, if uh, as soon as you have a retract relationship between U and V, then you have a subset relationship. So this is obviously inspired by, uh, by Albert's theorem, this definition of neat. And uh, a theory is tight if as soon as 
two extensions of it are bar interpretable when u is equal to v. So this is so these are all inspired by by this result of algebra by PA. It's very easy to see that neat implies tight because basically bar interpretation is a strengthening of a retract going both ways. So V is going to be a subset of U and U is going to be a subset of V. So this equality is going to occur naturally, uh, automatically. To see that uh, solidity implies neatness, um, basically solidity implies that all models of U are, are also, in this case, uh, are going to, are, let me just let me go like that. So I'm not talking about, I already said that neatness implied tightness is just a, a one-liner. For solidity implies neatness, um, by just looking at this definition, you can quickly see that uh, if, if U is solid um, and you have two extensions, U and V of, uh, of T, then um, all models of U are gonna be models of V. And that would mean that V is a subset of U by, by the completeness theorem of first order logic. So, so this relationship is also quite uh, easy to show, but it takes more work than the second arrow. But anyway, they're easy exercises. Also, um, it's, it's an easy but tedious exercise to check that solidity, neatness, and tightness are also preserved under by interpretations. So these are uh, um, very nice properties that uh, carry over with by interpretations. Um, okay, now let's look at the proof of, uh, uh, of solidity of PA. Uh, so I'm gonna uh, first present you the proof um, the way you would read in the paper, then I'm gonna show you the, the picture proof. So if you have three models of PA um, such that um, M interprets N and N interprets M star, then you can define an isomorphism from M to N. Um, and this isomorphism, uh, let's see, did I write down? Oops, sorry. Let's see what did I write down. There's an M definable isomorphism from M to M star. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm sorry, that was part of the definition. This is part of the assumption. Um, this is this is the where the proof starts, uh, uh, meaning this is just repeating the the assumption. PA has a key feature that if M is a model of PA and N is a model of PA minus, so this is just the part of PA which doesn't even need induction. Then, um, as soon as M is able to interpret N, um, N would be able to embed itself as an initial segment of of N. The point is as follows. Uh, in any model of PA, if any model of PA can define a linear ordering with the first element and with the property that every element other than the uh, first element has an immediate successor, then that model of arithmetic can embed itself by a recursion in an initial segment of that linear order. It's a very basic uh, recursion that, that you can basically uh, embed um, uh, the model of PA inside any model in any linear order in a way um, as, a, as, a, as a linear order if you want to just think of it uh, with, with the property that it basically satisfies PA minus. Here we want of course plus and times to be also preserved hence the PA minus as opposed to just a linear order. But, but this part is, uh, is just a simple recursion. So if you already have um, um, Let's see. Um, so there's a there's a such an initial embedding between M and N, and, and similarly there would be one. Let me just look at this diagram again. So basically there's an embedding initial embedding from M to N. There's an initial embedding from N to M star. So this other one I'm calling uh, uh, J zero, and then um, you want to show that these embeddings are both sub surjective. They're both onto, and uh, you argue suppose not. Um, if not, then J of M is a proper initial segment of M star, where this J is the result of uh, just it of, of uh, composing J one and J zero, um, and then by taking the inverse image of I zero of this set, you get a proper definable initial segment of M with no last element. So this is, I'm sure, going way too fast for you if you haven't seen this argument before, uh, but this is. Basically, how it looks like when you if you write it up in a paper, 
But uh, uh, let me, before I come back to that, just look at the picture. Uh, this, this picture maybe is not as, the, the coloration is not as um, strong as it should be, but hopefully it will do the job. Uh, this picture, you're supposed to be able to see the argument in, in basically just in one go with minimal formalism. Um, the point is that if M interprets N um, and N inter interprets M star, then this J zero would be an, an embedding that N can define, that it could define an embedding, an initial embedding of, of itself into this other model that it, it can define, this N that it can define. And now um, this, this dotted line here is supposed to be the image of this embedding. And, and we want to show basically that this embedding is surjective. But not only we want to show this embedding is surjective, but it turns out we can also show this other embedding is surjective, which the same idea is happening here because N is interpreting M star, there's an embedding J1 definable in N that embeds N and as initial segment of M star. So this is, these two embeddings are born by, by recursion. Um, the fact that there's an isomorphism between the first model and the last model is part of the, of the of, of what it means to check that something is solid. Basically, the way we check something is solid is that we say, if the first model is isomorphic to the last model, um, then the middle model is, is isomorphic to the first model, and therefore all three models are isomorphic. You cannot squeeze something in the middle. So this one comes for free. This, this I0 comes for free. And the whole point is that if one of these embeddings, um, J0 or J1, um, were not, um, uh, were not surjective, then um, the image of M in, uh, in M star, meaning J, think of J of M, where J of M is the iteration, not iteration, sorry, of, is the composition of J0 with J1. Just imagine taking, taking M, applying J0, and then J1, that would be J of M. Um, and J of M, if you now take the, it would be a proper initial segment of M star if either J0 or J1 were not subjective. And therefore, by taking the inverse image of this isomorphism, you will be able to construct a definable cut um, in a model of PA, which is, of course could not happen. A model of PA should not have a subset which is close under successor and also has zero in it. So um, let me pause here for a moment just to see that this proof is using, overtly is using the full power of PA. Because to embed J0 um, M into N, you're doing a recursion that uh, would be as complex as the, 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 um, op the arithmetical operations in, in, in N. The recursion basically uh, is gonna send zero of M to zero of N, and it takes any successor in M to the corresponding successor in N. Now the successor operation in N could be quite complicated you know, it, because we're allowing the plus and times of n to be definable by any arbitrary formula. So this J0, we cannot put any premium on how complicated it is. And the same thing with this J1. And of course, the same thing with this I0. And therefore, the complexity of this cut overtly is as high as could be. It's, looking at the proof, one cannot just say how much induction is used because it, it actually is using all of induction. Hence the, the conjecture that PA basically is the optimal theory that there is no uh, proper subtheory of PA that is, uh, that is solid. Uh, any questions? So, so when you say full power of PA, you mean you can't take away a single axiom? Mm, uh, thank you. Uh, well, no obvious axiom. <laughs> Uh, or, or more, more importantly, uh, no amount of, in, we, we cannot limit the amount of induction that uh, is being used. There's, there's no obvious axiom, there's no proper sub-theory of PA that does the job. Maybe I, I should put it that way. If I just told you, okay, we have this proof now which works for PA, um, come up with a sub-theory of PA that, uh, but by sub-theory, I mean a sub-theory that is closed under uh, deductions for which this argument goes through, uh, it, it's not clear if there is one. And the conjecture is that there is none actually. Thank you. Uh, sure. If you um, put restrictions on all of the complexity, so let's say you said that I zero was uh, sigma K definable 
for some standard K, and then each of these interpretations, N and M and M star and N are, I, I, maybe you're off by one here. So maybe sigma K plus one or maybe sigma K minus one or something along those lines. Um, right, so you know that the interpretation of the successor function in N is, it, you, you have some handle over, uh, over that. And so therefore you can build this J zero in some, in, in some low complexity way, does that uh, does that help recover sort of a um, sort of a, a like a, a sigma k image of this theorem or, or something along? Yeah, that? yeah, I think I, I think it does. I think yeah, I think it certainly does. I think like for sigma one, meaning if that this this embedding is uh, sigma one and this is sigma one and this is also sigma one, then. Um, Right, then, and then M shouldn't have any sigma one definable cuts. So right, right, um, right. So I th so there is a parametric version, and as you said, it might be off by one because you're uh, right. then. Uh, uh, but um, it, it yeah. So so, but as I as I said, um, so so I think that's that's interesting to know. Then it's good to keep track of it actually to see, like how much exactly then it, like what sigma, sigma k do, or I haven't sat down and checked it, but I did think about the sigma one case um, and, and it seems to go through with, with no problem. Um, but again, um, somehow because of the fact that interpretability theory is mostly about all formulas, you know, it kind of, I mean, it's nice to be able to pin down uh, these limited versions uh, and therefore uh, have a parallel side study, yeah. Um, and, uh, and the, the question would be, what kind of surprising results would you get by limiting it? Um, and that I don't know yet. I, mean, I, haven't, I haven't really looked at in limited interpretability that much. Right, I, I mean, I, I guess the question is, is there, um, so, so there's a few questions, but, but, but first, is there like a, um, is I sigma n, sigma n solid in some, in, in some way, if you, maybe again, maybe off by one, here um, and then, uh, what what goes wrong at, at like the level, the next so what, that least level where where things can go wrong? Oh uh, no, I think I sigma n is probably let's just assume I sigma n is solid for each n, but that doesn't. But sorry, solidity in this modified form. Right, right, sigma n solid. Some, some right, sort of sigma n, n solid. Or n right. solid however you want. Right. Yeah. right, right, but that that still doesn't give any any idea of, of the status of this conjecture because mm -hmm. of it being all over the place. Um, right. At least overtly it doesn't seem to me to help to, to parameterize it, to, to settle the conjecture, although it would be nice to be able to pin that, sit down and do the, the calculation to make sure everything is sitting well, you know, with, and, and as opposed to plus or minus one being added somewhere, yeah. Um, so just to continue. So I'll try to wrap up um, within, let's say about 10 minutes of, of uh, after, after the hour um, and, and whatever is left, I'll leave for the next lecture. Is that okay? Yeah, that sounds good. Sure. Okay, so um, the theories that um, are known to be solid, and this was shown in my 2016 paper besides a PA, is a um, second order arithmetic, Zermelo-Franco set theory, and then the second order version of set theory, uh, Kelly-Moore set theory, and also the higher order analogs of Z2 and KM, third order and higher order arithmetic and set theory. Um, but other interesting examples include um, this, um, this theory, which is close to ZF fin, except that this theory, you're not negating infinity you're simply um, removing infinity and adding TC. So you can check actually that this theory is also solid. And, and to, to show this theory is solid, you would need to basically use the fact that ZF is solid and PA is solid and that no model of PA interprets a model of ZF or vice versa. Uh, sorry, no model of, um, that the retract relationship doesn't hold basically between a model of PA and ZF. Uh, but it, it takes a little bit of work to show this one, but uh, it can be done. Um, and then Tarski arithmetic. I, I like this example because it's an extension of, of piano arithmetic in, in an extended language, basically where you allow a predicate T for the truth predicate. 
And, and the axioms that you add to PA is that this T satisfies the compositional clauses. Uh, that's just finitely many clauses. So you could also show that this, this theory is, uh, is solid. And therefore, of course, it's tight. Uh, um, now, in the last uh, lecture in this series, uh, uh, Cameron uh, was talking about the failure of of uh, 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 Ali. Ali, a quick, quick question because you sure. put very quickly about Tarski arithmetic. What yeah, about yeah, yeah, PA, sure. what about P star? Oh, thank you, thank you. So P A star in general is is not solid because if you suppose we have P A parentheses x and um, and x is a new predicate and we don't say anything about x, okay? We just say P A x. We just allow this x. Um, then uh, you could interpret um, in this theory. You could, if you do look at just look at PA, you can interpret PA x plus x is empty, and PA x plus x is singleton one, for example. This is I just I'm giving you a silly example. Mm -hmm. So so PA x plus x is empty, and PA x uh, plus x is uh, singleton one are bi interpretable, but they're obviously not the same theory. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. And then, so, and then another interesting example, actually, along these lines, would be uh, P A X plus X is generic. Right. So what happens then? So, so there also it's not solid because if you're generic, then you could shift the generic, let's say, by one. That set is also going to be generic, and but then not isomorphic. Uh, they're, yeah, they're not isomorphic. Isomorphic. Exactly. I see. All right. So the, yeah. So, so there's something. What is, what is P A X? An extra oh. predicate. Yeah, you add an extra predicate to the language, you allow formulas mentioning that predicate to be used in the induction axiom. Okay, so extra predicate and then, and then induction with the predicate. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and then you could decide to ask, if you decide then that's predicate generic or something. That's yeah, yeah, exactly. Then, 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 then to be generic would be an infinite set of sentences saying that it meets every dense set, you know, in a, in a, in a scheme, you can write that down, yeah. Um, okay. Um, right. So I was just saying, um, Cameron was, was basically um, giving proofs of failure of solidity and tightness of, of, of certain sub theories of, of Z2. And that was, was basically informed by this conjecture that even though Z2 is solid, uh, somehow the proof suggests that. Uh, that uh, none of his proper sub theories are solid, uh, and but but because his talk did not include the proof of solidity, which uh, I mean he has already he had already a lot to say in his talk. Uh, uh, it's good to see the proof of solidity of Z two uh, because you 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 basically have to use the PA idea plus one new idea, which is uh, added to the to the mix. Uh, so um, just imagine now you have three models of Z two. The first one interprets the second one. The second one interprets the third one. The first one also sees an isomorphism between itself and the third one. And you want to show that the first one can also see an isomorphism between itself and the middle one. You're going to be seeing this on the, on the picture too. But uh, so it's going to start basically with three models. Um, but then if you look, look at the argument we gave for PA, you could repeat that argument to at least see that there's an isomorphism between the number part of the, of, of the models um, um, involved, um, K0 and, and K1 between the numbers part. Once, once you still see the picture here, you, this is gonna make a lot more sense and we can maybe come back to it. But by repeating the argument that you saw for solidity, we can get at least the number parts to be isomorphic. Um, and then now we want the set part to be also isomorphic and you want a particular map to be surjective. That's the map that I'm calling um, K0. Um, and let me just put it in writing here so you see how again, how it would look like in a, in a paper. Um, and, and now it looks quite exotic and uh, nonsensical, but let me look at a picture now. This picture hopefully will show you what's going on in a, in a glance. Um, so I'm gonna go through this slowly. Um, we have three models of second order arithmetic. Models of second order arithmetic, basically, each of them comes as a pair, a model of PA, comma, a bunch of subsets of the model. So the first model is M, comma, A. This A is the cloud hovering over, over M. Same idea with the second model, this model of arithmetic N, with the cloud B hovering over it. And the same idea with M star and A star. Three models of 
second order of arithmetic. Uh, and again, to repeat, um, the first one interprets the second one, the second one interprets the third one. The first one knows that the third one is isomorphic to itself. And we want to show that the first one can see an isomorphism, a definable one, obviously, between itself and the middle. So the point of the argument of that I gave, uh, this uh, Albert's argument basically in this context can be carried out to show that M star would be isomorphic to, just as a model, ignore the, the sets here. M star is gonna be isomorphic to N, it's gonna be isomorphic to, to the first one. These isomorphisms I'm calling K1 and K0. And um, so that's, now once you have K1, which is an isomorphism gotten from that, repeating that proof, that isomorphism between M star and N lifts through an embedding K1 hat. So this hat is the lifting of the embedding to the second order part. So this K1 hat is the richer isomorphism. It not only tells you where do the numbers go, it also tells you where the sets go. And uh, because of the fact that if you give you an object here, is a subset of M star is determined by its elements. You could basically use extensionality basically to, to, to this, uh, lift this K1 to, to K1 hat. It's not clear at this point that this is a surjective. That's the whole idea. This is what we want to show. Even though we know K1 is an isomorphism, we don't know at this point that K1 hat is, is surjective. Same idea with, with K0. Uh, we have this embedding, we lift it to K0 hat, and therefore we have an embedding from this cloud, which is B, to this cloud, which is A. Now, um, we um, also know there is an isomorphism between the first model and the last model that came with our assumption to prove this theorem, and that we're calling I zero hat. So anything with the hat is basically an isomorphism of models of second order structures as opposed to just first order structures. Okay. So the, the point is that if you look at the map, uh, look at this map here, you see a trace of it here, K0 hat, K1 hat, I0 hat. But just think of K as, uh, as, as um, uh, let's see, looks like I have I0. Yeah, so look at this I0 that I have. Uh, looks like this, my arrow, this is an isomorphism, so it doesn't matter where I put the arrow. This arrow should have gone, um, from, from here to here, from A to A star. So this arrow, this green arrow should be going from this first blob to the last blob. So imagine, um, and remember of course, I zero also will take the numbers of, of M to the numbers of M star. So imagine going from, um, from this first structure to the second structure by first going via I zero, via I zero. Remember I zero going, is, is going that way. And then coming back using this, trains uh, K1 and, and K0. So we're composing these maps to, to make a loop. Hence this idea of this, this map K. This map K is basically the composition of three maps. K right now doesn't have a hat because it's just only on numbers. Now, um, here's where we're using second order arithmetic to show that K is, um, is the identity. K is a, um, automorphism of M definable in this big structure. And, uh, and because no model of PA thinks of having an iso automorphism other than the identity, the same thing happens for, um, for second order arithmetic. Um, no, basically the same, the same proof works for second order arithmetic. Um, and in both cases, um, you need um, arbitrary induction or, or arbitrary comprehension because you don't know how complex is this um, tensor, this, this K, uh, this purportive K, we don't know how, how complex is the definition, but the key new idea here is to be able to get the job done is that no model of PA or PA star or, or, or second order arithmetic has a non-trivial automorphism. And that's exactly where K then would have to be the identity, which would then show that these two maps, K0 and K1 are subjective. At that point, it becomes kind of an elementary point point chasing argument, meaning once you know that this K is the, is the identity, then it's, it's really a routine to show, to show that, uh, that this guy is an isomorphism. So that's the, the K 
picture for the idea, except for this picture. But before I um, share this, this, this slides with you, I'll correct the typos and also, uh, which includes this, uh, this, uh, this arrow. And uh, looks like at this point, let's see, I, I got 10 minutes after. What I have left here is uh, the discussion of internal categoricity, which uh, is a few slides. So I'll, I can just uh, do this next time so that I won't go any more over time. Okay, sounds great. So um, let's all thank Ali. Thank you very much. And um, again, um, uh, you know, there was no shortage of questions during the talk, but uh, please feel free to uh, speak up if you have a question now. But his, historically, um, it's not, the notion of interpretability in biotech, these notions are, are quite, they came early in model theory, did they not? So it looks like, you know, they, they came out informally at, in, in kind of ad hoc places. And the, the person who seems to have first unified them at the theory level was Tarski in that yeah. famous work he yeah. did with uh, mm -hmm. Robinson and, uh, and uh, Mostovsky. Ah, well, that, that's what I meant by early. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so basically, um, I think uh, already in geometry, you know, with uh, interpretations of non-Euclidean oh. geometries. Oh, of that, course, that's, yeah. That's, 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 I guess, probably the, old, the oldest real examples, yeah. Mm, yeah, yeah. So it is fundamental stuff, yeah. Yeah, it, and, it, and, and, and somehow it's, it's funny because... Uh, the modern discussion has been mostly focusing on theory interpretability, but but this model interpretability is already quite. Uh, it's, it's, it there's has less formalism and also has more concreteness to it. So I, I, mm -hmm. I find it quite useful to be also playing with that and talking about it. Um, I have a, I have a question. Uh, it's something that I spent a little time thinking, uh, but I couldn't come up easily with a with an answer. And the point is that, can we find a theory that is not solid, but you can, a theory that it's not solid, but by it, it has by interpretable models. So what I'm saying is like something, some example that distinguishes solidity from tightness. You know? Oh, this yes, yes. Because I, uh, <laughs> in the examples I worked with, uh -huh. because you're already proving something stronger, you know, like, oh, there is no, uh, if you're already yes. proving something stronger, I don't care too much because in the examples I'm, I, I, I usually work, uh, uh, we are already proving that it's not solid, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious if there is something that exemplifies this distinction. Yeah, so, so let, let me give you the short answer. No, I don't have an example, but but let me, let me at the same time add, add, add a little bit to it because it would be an interesting discussion for the, also the rest of the group. So the theories that we know that they're solid because of the fact that solid implies tight, we know how to make they're tight. And then when we show something is not solid, we can often look at the examples we have and then show that it's also not tight. So that exactly. one takes more work, right? So, so, so in the natural cases, somehow these notions the arrows go back and forth. In one case, always. In the other case, practically in all cases. But so the question Alfredo is asking is that: Is it really true that um, that tightness doesn't imply solidity just abstractly? And uh, and this is a question that I've actually often talked with, uh, at least with Mateusz Wewick, and we always came close to coming up with examples. And then the last. <laughs> something would, would yeah, wrong. it's like it, it should have an example, but it's super yeah. like so, counterintuitive. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's very counterintuitive, but I think it should, at this point it should be done. I mean, even though it's not. Yeah, it's it not should not, be done. I, I yeah. agree. But uh, I mean, it's, but, uh, it, it's at least evidence. I mean, if, if, the, if the examples is too weird, it's at least an evidence that you can kind of collapse these two versions and in most cases think as they are basically the same, right? Right, so at this point, I think it would be 
fair to say that the example would be unnatural because all the natural theories we've looked at, we'd be able to settle whether they're solid, yes. sorry, solid or, or, or not solid, tight or not tight. And, um, and somehow in these natural examples, they fall together, solidity and tightness rise and fall together. So, so how about it? this is a conjecture uh, that uh, th there, is, there is such an example, but it's absolutely horrid. <laughs> Yeah, this is yeah, this is something. I I, I actually I, I try I think like when I was working with Joel on uh on this, we tried a little bit too, but we couldn't find a natural example. Um, yeah, so so now we have several people who've who've played with it, but it could be just a silly example, you know. Um yeah, so yeah, way, yeah, some I mean, one might, I mean, one, there might be also like a trick. So the fact that solidity, sorry, tightness is true for any complete theory, you know, might come handy because trivially every complete theory is, sol uh, is tight. Mm -hmm. So if we come up with a complete theory, so because all the examples we've been looking at in the, in, the, in, the, in the real world are these RE theories, right? So maybe there is some sort of complete theory that is, uh, not, not oh, solid. Yeah. And, and there is also another venue, I think. The venue is to think of theories that uh, you can find the isomorphisms, uh, but these isomorphisms are just because the theories, uh, the theories are very, uh, the theory is very, can't, what can I say? Like the theory has some automorphisms, right? But it's, uh -huh. but but it's not too general. It doesn't internalize too much about itself. Like PA or uh, ZF, it can like from one isomorphism, you basically have every isomorphism, right? So it's okay. what I'm saying is that maybe there are some weak theories that you can you can strengthen. Like, but I, I'm. I think I, I'm. I'm. I'm completely confused now. But uh, <laughs> the point is that maybe maybe it's a mixture of these two things. Like starting from a weak theory, like the complete real fields, and take a complete version of it. So it's tight, and then uh, the automorphisms are are rare, right? In a sense. Yeah, maybe. I mean, yeah, it could it could very well be some yeah some some such tricks at work. And so somehow I'm not convinced that's going to be that. Maybe maybe horrid is not the right word. I think we haven't just looked in the right places. Maybe meaning the, the places where we looked at have been looking at these kind of fragments of arithmetic and set theory, as opposed to you know more arbitrary theories, the say equivalence relations or what you know uh, uh, things with automorphisms. Uh, but it's, 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 it's a good exercise and it, it, it needs to get done. <laughs> yeah, sure. Other questions or discussion? Okay, let's, let's thank Ali again and um, Thank you, Ali. And um, Ali will continue uh, this presentation next week um, at the same time. So we will see you all then. Hey.